By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at a match between a mono red deck featuring four rock hydras and two headed giants and Keldon warlords. It's it's such a beautiful deck. It's being piloted by Yoop, played by Yoop. Um, he is my opponent today and I'm playing with a living plane Timmy deck. So it's blue and it's green. It's a new thing I've been working on. I'm really looking forward to test it out in this match. Now, before I start with the deck decks, as always, you can also skip that section by going to the, to the description below and there you will find several timestamps. One of those stamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the game action. And as for here, I'm going to start with the deck deck and I'm going to start with the deck of my opponent, Yoop. Let's take a look at his mono red Rock Hydra Brew. And here we see the deck of my opponent, man. What a beautiful deck. So I've just called it Rock Hydra and Friends because it's not just the Rock Hydra that's so cool about this deck. There's just so many cool cards, but maybe, you know, Rock Hydra is a nice place to start. So let's first just kind of zoom in on this card. There are four in this deck, two red and X to cast. And this is the current Oracle text. It says Rock Hydra enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. For each one damage that would be dealt to Rock Hydra, it has a plus one plus one counter on it. Remove that counter from it and prevent that one damage, right? So, for example, if it's an 8-8 eight, eight and it's been being dealt, uh, it's being blocked by a 4-4, four, four, it gets four damage. So it l actually uh, loses four plus one plus one counters. But there is a little catch. For each red mana, you can prevent the next one damage that would be dealt to Rock Hydra this turn. So it kind of has this weird regeneration clause where you can kind of keep the heads on. I think it's very... Uh, flavorful, right? Because that's what happens to a Hydra. You cut off a head and two heads pop back up, right? Talking about heads coming back up, there's another ability on this creature that allows you to grow new heads, which is really cool as well. You can pay three red and then you can put a plus one plus one counter on Rock Hydra and you can only activate this ability during your upkeep. So I, I think it's just um, extremely cool that this creature can and also kind of prevent damage and at the same time, it can also grow hats. Unfortunately, only during the upkeep, which is something that you see a lot in old school. It's something I actually like. I mean, they made upkeep really an, an, an important phase in old school magic. It's a phase that doesn't uh, really see that much uh, importance anymore in the modern game of magic. But when you play old school like us, you know, upkeep is really a big deal. Upkeep is something you gotta keep in your mind, you know, when you're playing magic. We take it seriously, you know, in 93, 94 Magic. Anyway, let's look at some of the other really cool creatures in this deck. You know, I mean, look at those two-headed giants. So it's two-headed giant of fouries. It's one red and four to cast for a 4-4 four, four Trampler. And the cool thing is that it may block two attacking creatures, divide damage between them however the controller likes. So the cool thing is you can, you can block and you can just block an extra creature basically which could be relevant you know because he's playing against living plane so i'm kind of going for a swarm tactic just having a lot of one one creatures right in attack and you know then he can with one two at a giant he can actually take out two lands okay so keep an eye on what i'm saying here because that could be relevant and um what other creatures do we see in here we see a lovely fire elemental earth elemental they're absolutely great um, we also see a, a Frost Giant. Wow, Frost Giant. That's a card you don't see often. Frost Giant is one of those cards that has Rampage, which is this absolute weird ability. So Frost Giant is a three red and three to cast for a four four with Rampage two. And Rampage is whenever this creature becomes blocked, it gets plus two plus two unto end of turn for each creature blocking it beyond the first. So if you want to block this with two creatures, hey, that's fine. But then the Frost Giant becomes a 6-6 six, six because the Rampage is two. If the Rampage would be one, it would just become a 5-5, five, five, by the way. So there's a little difference um, there. But this is a really cool card. Obviously, the reason it doesn't see a lot of play is that insane casting cost. I mean, look at it. Three red and three to cast a 4-4 four, four with an ability that's, you know, average at best. It's a, but it's a very cool card though, so I think it's great that uh, that you that you've brought it to the table in this deck. Then there's another. There are just so many cool creatures here. I can talk about this creature base forever. He's got Keldon Warlord, which is two red and two to cast, and you know it. It's the power and toughness depends on the amount of creatures on the board on your side. So if Yoop has four creatures, the Keldon Warlord is a four four, and the Warlord itself it's also counted for. So the more creatures he plays out, the bigger the Warlord gets which I guess kind of works in this creature-heavy deck 
Then he's got Aladdin. Aladdin, card from Arabian Nights, really sweet two red and two to cast, I believe. And you can steal artifacts with Aladdin, which is really cool. You can pay something, tap it, steal an artifact. The cool thing is you can then untap Aladdin, you still have the artifact. You have the artifact as long as Aladdin uh, is under your control, right? So as soon as Aladdin gets bounced back to your hand or, you know, or dies or whatever, uh, then you lose control of that. Um, but as long as you just have the Aladdin, you can just keep stealing artifacts. He's basically this, this, <laughs> this kind of, I, I just see him walking around this busy bazaar of Baghdad kind of stealing stuff left, right, and center. That's how I see Aladdin. I think it's a really cool card. Arabian Nights, of course, in general, one of the coolest sets ever. Uh, and then we also see Ali from Cairo talking about cool cards from Arabian Nights. Uh, two red, and I believe, is it two to cast or is it... Let's have a look here. Ali uh, from Cairo. I'm just going to look it up. Uh, yeah, two red and two to cast. And uh, the cool thing is it's an all one creature. And I'm just going to read the current Oracle text. Damage that would reduce your life total to less than one reduces it to one instead. And the cool thing is this card used to be banned because players said, Ali from Cairo is forcing me to play with removal and I do not want to play with removal. Can you imagine going to um, any tournament and play a deck with zero creature removal. Like that is something <laughs> that is something you can't even imagine anymore. But now that I'm saying it, I'm thinking it would be pretty cool. And I guess, I mean, I'm not even, ta I'm, I'm, I'm talking, you're not even playing counter spells, right? Because I can see that work with counter spells and, and whatever. But I'm talking just no creature removal. You can do nothing. Your opponent casts a creature. It is what it is, right? And the argument was at the time when they banned this card was, Ali from Cairo forces you to play with some kind of way to deal with creatures, and we don't want to force players to do that. Now, obviously, it turned out it wasn't such a big deal. Everybody was playing with some kind of removal anyway if you wanted to, you know, basically win a couple of games. So Ali from Cairo got off the banned list again, and it's now back on the wagon. Unfortunately, this is one of those cards um, that is now so expensive because I would love to kind of own one, maybe even a place that brew around it, but yeah, it's kind of out of out of reach, and I guess for many players it's out of reach now, but it's still a lovely, beautiful card. Look at that art. It looks like he's holding a Mox, right? Uh, it's, it's really a beautiful card, and the ability is fantastic. Uh, and then we see some flyers in the deck, four granite gargoyles, a Sheevan dragon, and then in the middle of the pile, I think we see the most dangerous part of this deck. Obviously, we're playing red, and that means lightning bolts, fire bolts, and even chain lightnings in this deck. And also, because he's playing mono red, Eternal Flame can do some work here. So yeah, you know, this is this is a pretty um pretty good deck. And I think I think well good, I mean I think the center of the deck is kind of what you expect in a red deck, right? Uh, you know, lightning bolts, chain lightning, fireballs, and I think that's kind of the business side of this deck. So he's got a lot of big creatures that as an opponent you've got to kind of deal with because if you leave a five five rock hydra unattendant, I mean, you get killed fairly quickly, right? So you gotta do something against that. And at the same time, you got to worry uh, about direct damage, you know. Uh, so it is, it, the deck is tougher than it looks, okay. Um, and then on the left side, we see the land base. And we see another card that I wanted to discuss, uh, a card that I think is really cool. I actually acquired my own copy of this card because it just, I just love the art. And I'm talking about Knowledge Vault, art by Amy Weber. Absolutely beautiful art. Four to cast, and it's kind of... I guess you could use it to replace Gem Day Tome. In a way, I think that's what it does in this deck because there's no Gem Day Tome, but there are two of these Knowledge Vaults. Um, it's an artifact to and tap, exile the top card of your library face down. I'm just reading current Oracle text. Zero, sacrifice Knowledge Vault if you do discard your hand and then put all cards exiled with Knowledge Vault into their owner's hand. When Knowledge Vault leaves play, put all cards exiled with Knowledge Vault into their owner's graveyard. Now, there are a few things that I like about this card. Now. First off, in the, you can activate it whenever. You can activate it instant speed. It doesn't have this upkeep clause, right? Which I like. So at the end step of your opponent, you can, if you've got two mana to spend, you can say two and tap and just exile the top card, put it under your vault. And slowly, without your opponent really noticing, you can start really getting a lot of cards under that vault. And then when your hand's empty or almost empty or you only have lands in your hand or for whatever reason you need to find an answer, you can pay zero, so you don't have to pay any cost, and you can sacrifice the Knowledge Vault, right? And then you can take all the cards that are under the Vault directly into your hand. And yes, you've got to discard your hand. And there's the second thing I like, 
even though the knowledge vault gets exiled, the cards under the vault do not. They just go to your graveyard. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the cards in your, in your hand go to the graveyard. But also if your knowledge vault gets destroyed, you know, so you don't have a chance to, uh, to use it, the cards under the knowledge vault will go to the graveyard. Now, the cool thing is, you can activate it at instant speed. So you can activate it in response to, for example, your opponent playing a crumble. I, I believe I'm, I've got some crumbles in, in the main board and in the sideboard in this matchup. So I can say I'm going to crumble your knowledge vault. At that time, my opponent can make a choice. Is my hand good enough? Or is my hand moi or simply bad? Then I'm just going to sacrifice my knowledge vault, put my creatures in the graveyard, and I can simply get the cards under the Knowledge Vault. You can do that in response of a Crumble, of a Shatter, of a Disenchant. It doesn't matter, you know. So that's what I like. This card is more versatile than you may think. Also, I guess in some kind of weird way, you can use this in some kind of Reanimator strategy. So if you love playing Reanimator and you're looking at this, maybe you should consider picking up a copy because it, it's quite interesting. It is just another way of getting cards into your graveyard. And if you want creatures in your graveyard, I mean, Knowledge Vault could kind of get you there in this weird way, but we're playing old school, right? Most of our methods, original methods, are going to be kind of weird. Anyway, I really love seeing these Knowledge Vaults. I'm looking forward to these matches, forward to playing against this deck. Uh, Yoop, man, thank you for bringing this beauty to the table. Now let's take a look at my deck, Timmy's Plane. And here we see my deck, Timmy's Plane. Now, obviously, I've called it Timmy's Plane because of a Living Plane and Protocol Sorcerer. Now, Living Plane is an Enchant World from Legends. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous card. Two green and two to cast. And it just turns every land into 1-1 one, one creatures. That also means that the lands, when Living Plane's in play, lands also suffer from summoning sickness because they're now creatures. And that is pretty essential, right? Because this deck has a lock in it, and the lock is... Protocol Sorcerer and Living Plane. So Protocol Sorcerer, of course, the Timmy, one blue and two to cast for a 1-1, one, one, and you can tap to deal one damage to any target, right? So if I have Living Plane on the board, I can start killing my opponent's lands with my Timmy, right? So that's kind of a way. This is basically a land destruction deck. That's, that's what it is, a land destruction control deck. And obviously, control and land destruction go hand in hand. You see I'm playing with four Ice Storms, I'm playing with, you know, four Protocol Sorcerers. I'm playing with three Living Lands. So what I want to do is early game, I want to play my Lanawer Elves. I want to try to ramp my uh, my Ice Storm turn two so I can start slowing down my opponent. So my opponent is going slowly moving forward. And that gives me time to assemble all the pieces I need, right? Because I then want to play a Protocol Sorcerer. And if everything goes well, I'm hoping to cast that Living Lands turn four or turn five. So, and as soon as I've got the Living Lands on board, I can use my Timmy to start killing the lands of my opponent. Now, another really nice card uh, that goes really well with the Living Plane is a Triskelion. Now, Triskelion, of course, is a very well-known card. A lot of people play it. You know, the Robots deck, one of the most popular decks at the moment. You know, six to cast. It comes in with three plus one plus one counters. So it's a four, four. You can remove a counter to deal one damage to any target. Basically, when you've got Living Plane on board and you play your Triskelion, you can use your Trike as a card to just destroy three lands of your opponent. Can you imagine? I'm really hoping that I can kind of pull that off and show you how incredibly powerful that is. Because you just get rid of three lands with one card and you even have a one, one left to attack or to block or, you know, whatever you want to do with that card. So it is really, really strong, the Triskelion Living Plane combination. Um, when we look at the rest of the deck, we do see some power. I feel always feel like these kind of trick decks that usually go too slow and are not business-like enough, power can really help to kind of give them that advantage. Like taking an extra turn with a deck like this can be crucial. For example, take an extra turn means your protocol sorcerer no longer has summoning sickness. I can start pinging straight away. It means you can drop your living plane and you can drop a Timmy, you know, uh, you can do all sorts of things. So time walk, I think is really an essential card here. I've got ancestral recall in your one blue, of course, draw three cards. Amazing. In my opinion, the best card in magic. Uh, and then you've got Regrowth, and Regrowth, of course, makes these cards even stronger. If you're playing with power and restricted cards, then Regrowth becomes even better because you can get them back out of your graveyard and simply play them again. Now, there are a couple of other neat tricks that I've built in this deck. For example, you see one city in a bottle, and maybe you're wondering, why is he playing city in a bottle? Well, first off, I'm not playing any Arabian Nights, right? So it's not really going to hurt me. Well, I'm playing two city of brasses, that's true. But still, 
And in, in my case, I'm actually using it, okay, I can use it against creatures, that's fine, but I'm also using it as a land destruction spell. A lot of decks are playing with Arabian Nights lands. You see Diamond Valley more and more. Of course, Library of Alexandria, I don't have to explain that. So for me, uh, the city in a bottle is really a big help. You know, it can just destroy these lands. And the more lands I can destroy, the more likely I, I, I am to kind of get my living plane protocol sorcerer lock going and I can control the game and eventually win the game. Now, another thing in here is I'm playing with Sylvan Library, one green and one to cast. Look at the top three cards of your deck. You can put them in any order, then draw. And if you want, you can draw extra cards, but you got to pay four life for every extra card drawn that way. And you can only uh, draw two max right now. Living, uh, I'm sorry, Sylvan Library is really good at the moment when you play it, when you get to look at three fresh new cards. But when it's been in play a little bit longer, the card doesn't get as good because you already know that the two cards you've put back on top are usually, you know, maybe two lands, maybe another Sylvan. They're not always great. Maybe in this deck, even another Living Plane one. I already have a Living Plane on board. Remember, it's an Enchant World, so I cannot play two Living Planes at the same time. You know, you cannot have two Enchant Worlds on the board at the same time. So, you know, you could get into this situation where like, okay, it's nice I've got a Sylvan, but now I know that my two cards that I've got on top of the deck are just bad and I don't really want to draw them. So it's just not that great. And then when your opponent removes the Sylvan, you know you've got two turns where you got to go through two cards that you don't really want to have that are not very useful. So in that way, Sylvan can actually start kind of, especially mentally kind of work against you. But, you know, the solution to that is actually Untamed Wilds. And I think on this deck photo, I only see one Untamed Wilds. I believe I'm playing two. So maybe this is, um, but maybe I'm just playing one. But in my recollection, I'm playing two Untamed Wilds. Maybe I'm not seeing the other. But anyway, Untamed Wilds is a card that I think is a little bit underplayed. Uh, it's one green and two. Beautiful art by Nene Thomas. Um, and it allows you to search up any basic land and put it into play untapped. And this is sorcery, by the way. And after that, you shuffle your library. And that shuffle effect is really good with Sylvan Library because if I shuffle my library again, the next turn, I get to see three fresh cards. I mean, that is really sweet. And of course, gaining extra land in uh, a deck with Living Plane is not a bad thing either because it's basically an extra 1-1 one -one body on the ground that I can use to attack with, okay? So um, this is my deck. Let me know what you think. Um, as you can see, uh, it's also pretty aggressive against artifacts uh, because I'm playing two Energy Flux and three Crumbles main. The reason for that, of course, is if you're attacking the mana base in old school, but you're not attacking the artifacts, you're not really attacking the mana base, are you? Because old school means Moxen, uh, you know, it means... Soul Ring, you can even see four mana volts because they're not restricted in old school. So if you want to attack the mana base, you also got to attack the artifact, right? And that's why there's so much artifact hate in this deck as well. Okay, this is my living plane deck. This is my list for now. And yes, I consciously chose not to include red. I wanted to keep it blue and green. Not sure if that's a good decision. We're just going to see how it plays, how it, how it works. And I'm really looking forward to testing it in this matchup against you okay so this is my deck we've saw we've seen the deck of my opponent now let's go to the games game number one here we go island pass so i'm on the play i'm sitting on the right with the white sleeves my opponent you is on uh, with the red deck with the green sleeve strangely enough playing city of brush using it to cast a lana where lana is getting dealt with quickly with uh, the chain lightning that kind of makes sense take that mana dork out there's a simbat actually didn't discuss the simbat at all in the deck deck uh, Simbat works really well with Sylvan Library, right? Because I can put the cards in order in a way that I can tap Simbat and I see a land, right? Because Simbat says, tap, draw a card. If it's a land card, keep it. If it's not, discard the card. There is a Prodigal Sorcerer. So that card is very vital for my deck here. If I can get Living Plane next turn, there is Soul Ring and, oh, brutal, Fireball. At least I get a land from the Simbat, drawn a card from Simbat, but this is a really good move by you, Pierre, because I believe that I have a, um, a living plane in hand, and that would have been absolutely brutal in combination. Playing Time Walk here, by the way, so I'm still looking pretty good here. I'm in front with my lands. I'm taking an extra turn. I'm not doing anything with it, just passing. That is pretty painful. Not finding anything to do with that extra turn. That is not what you want to do. And it looks like I'm kind of in the tank here. Tapping four. Am I going to cast Living Plane? It seems really, really risky. Remember, I'm playing Mono Red. I'm playing against Fireballs, Lightning Bolts. I mean, I might be killing myself casting a Living Plane at the wrong moment, at the wrong time in this matchup. And uh, passing turn here. 
And there is a Granite Gargoyle 2-2 Flyer for one red. You can give it a plus one, a plus O oh, plus one. And responding it with a side Blast on the end step, killing it straight away before it can pump itself and make itself too big to be killed by the side Blast. And there is another Simbad. So I believe I'm playing with two in this deck. There is a two-headed Giant and a pass turn. So let's take a look, playing a Pendlehaven. Tapping four here, playing Control Magic on the two-headed giant. Attacking him for one because the desert is tapped. Remember, desert can deal one damage to an attacking creature after it's dealt damage. That means if you attack with a one-one, it can basically kill your one-one. So, you know, I don't want to lose my Simbad to a desert, obviously. At least now I've got the Pendlehaven as well. I've got, okay, playing Pirate Ship. 4-3. Unfortunately, it cannot attack because my opponent doesn't control any. Okay, it's gone already. Whatever. Why does it have three toughness? Why does it? Why? Why, WotC? And there's the Knowledge Vault, a card that I talked about in the deck deck. Very interesting artifact. And now we can kind of see it in action. And uh, there is a Triskelion. Okay, so this is looking pretty good for me. If I can now get a Living Plane on the board, I can kind of kill three uh, of his lands in one go. Let's see if I have it. Looks like I've got it. Tapping four. Okay, there's Living Plane. So I'm going to destroy three of his lands here. Probably going to take the Desert 2. It's just such an annoying card to play against, especially when your, your whole strategy is to swarm your opponent with 1-1s. One um, okay, so here we go. Not sure why I'm untapping my Pendlehaven. That's not correct. I could have tapped the City of Brass. So sorry here, Yupa, making a play mistake. We see you, by the way, using his Knowledge Vault, putting a card on uh, on the bottom there. So at the end, uh, well, actually at any moment in the game, he can pay two and tap the Knowledge Vault to put the top card of his library under the Knowledge Vault. And then he can sack the Knowledge Vault any time, and then he can get all the cards under the Knowledge Vault, but he has to discard his own hand. And it looks like I'm going for a major attacker, attacking with seven one ones. And here he's doing a double block. And in all honesty, I'm pretending not to mind, but I forgot about the two-headed giant, uh, giant's ability because two-headed giant has a unique ability. It can block two creatures, not just one, two. So he killed two of my lands with one two-headed giant. I mean, that's power play. And this two-headed giant is actually a huge problem for me because I kind of neglected that ability. And now I'm thinking, okay, if I attack with everything, um, you know, I'm basically going to lose two lands every turn. Is it worth that? And my conclusion is for now, it's not some passing turn. And here you can kind of see me getting into the danger zone. I want to play Living Plane and basically win the game. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, man, did you see that? Sim I used Simbat to look at the top card of my library. Remember, if it's not a land card, I got to put it in the bin, right? So now it's in the graveyard. So I've just millstoned my own Ancestral Recall, basically. That is horrible. That is horrible. And you now kind of, oh, Psionic Blast, why not? Psionic Blast would have been great against that two-headed giant. And you can kind of now see that I'm getting more and more into trouble. Okay, finding Sylvan. Sylvan Library and Simbad, that's a fantastic combination. Sylvan Library allows me to order the cards any way I want to so that I have a land on top when I activate my Simbad here. You're going to see that in action. So drawing card for turn and using Simbad, finding a land because I just put it there. Uh, which is great. Now, if I wouldn't have just, you know, milled my own Psionic Blast and Ancestral Recall, I would have been in a really, really good position because I could have played a Psionic Blast on that annoying two-headed giant and I could have just attacked with all my lands. But hey, it is what it is, right? That's magic for you. And this two-headed giant just is a fantastic card against my Living Plane strategy. Who would have thought? Almost making a mistake there again with piling up the cards. Uh, luckily, Yoop is pretty relaxed. Uh, it's, it's always something maybe you recognize this when you're playing with a new brew. You tend to kind of, you know, make some mistakes first. You got to kind of go through that. You got to get some games in with a new deck. At least I do. I know some players are just very talented, don't need to do that, but I definitely do. Look at the Knowledge Vault, by the way. Four cards under the Vault. There's a Chain Lightning on the Sim, but it makes absolute sense here from you to do that because I was kind of, you know, taking it over, drawing two cards a turn, uh, basically. Attacking here with the Gargoyle, going to drop the 13. Man, this is, uh, this is a tough one. Draw a card for turn, another forest. The problem is I'm also on 13. He's got a flyer. I don't have a flyer. He's playing direct damage, so I don't really want to pay for life with the Sylvan. But, I mean, the reason the best card I could find was a forest from the top kind of shows that those top three cards are not very good. 
And uh, yeah, that's a problem for me, definitely. Tapping for Kelden Warlord. Wow! Kelden Warlord is such a cool card with Living Plane. Remember, Yoop also has, his lands are also 1-1 one, one creatures. So that Kelden Warlord is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8, 8 Kelden Warlord. Wow. Wow. It just looks like Yoop's deck is kind of catered towards my deck in some kind of weird way. The two-headed giant is doing marvelous work. The Kelden Warlord is absolutely fantastic. Okay, now I'm finding a Timmy. So maybe this can kind of help me a little bit. But look at the Knowledge Vault. I think it's going to sack the Vault. Oh, man. A full grip of cards. And here you can see the power of Knowledge Vault. I couldn't find a Crumble to do anything against the Knowledge Vault. And there we see a Lightning Bolt on the Protocol Sorcerer. Yeah, I, th I think I think Yoop's got this game, to be honest. I mean, it's going to take some time. I'm not quite sure why he didn't attack with the flyer, by the way. I think if, if I would be Yoop in this case, I would just keep attacking with my 2-2 two -two flyer. and and Because then he's got me in six turns. I mean, he's got a full hand. He's got everything. I'm just going to attack him now, kind of do an alpha strike. And I'm kind of counting up. He's got two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine blockers. Two at a giant counts double. So he's got 11 blockers. So this whole attack is pretty much useless. Yeah, I'm, I shouldn't have done this, but I'm getting kind of impatient, to be honest. And I just want him to trade a couple of creatures kind of to make that Kelden Warlord smaller. He's on 13, so he kind of has to block something. He's going to block my two Tropical Islands with his two-headed giant. Going to use... Okay, he's going to block two Lunarer Elves on the two Rock Hydras. Remember, he can save the Rock Hydras by tapping two of, him, of his mountains. This is just a very bad exchange for me. I think this is a very bad attack. I mean, this is kind of amateur hour. Well, not amateur hour. This is kind of desperation mode from my side. I am really kind of feeling like that I'm losing this game, especially after that Knowledge Vault activation. But I kind of lost it earlier already when I milled away my own ancestral recall on psionic blast and decided to attack into that two-headed giant so several mistakes from my part have kind of led to this situation and of course strong play from my opponent as well and look at this exchange i'm getting absolutely demolished i'm only dealing what was that four points of damage or more okay he's on six so at least at least i've dealt some damage but yeah it, it, it's far from enough i'm on nine and he's looking at what he's got on the table here. It's difficult for him as well, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not that high, but I'm still... Okay, so he's attacking with the Warlord, chumping it with the City of Brass. Going to look at my top three cards again. I mean, attacking right now is not really going to help me much. Finding another City, which is basically another 1-1 one -one Soldier, right? And passing turn here. So... We are a little bit stuck. Another desert. Desert is actually pretty good in this matchup. And uh, oh, he's going to attack again with the Warlord. I'm probably going to chump it again. It's an interesting decision, right? I think I would... Let me know in the comments. I think I would just... Ooh, this is good. Stone Rain on Pendlehaven. I think I would just attack with the 2-2 Flyer. Because I have no Flyers. He could just deal... Two damage every time and slowly kill me. Oh, this is cool. Old Man of the Sea. <laughs> oh, sweet. Oh, I don't think that was on a deck picture, by the way. So probably was a tweak deck already, deck picture that I showed you. But Old Man of the Sea is a 2-3 um, from Arabian Nights. It's so cool. You can tap it. It can take over uh, a creature that, has, that doesn't have a bigger uh, power than the Old Man himself. So, for example, I could steal the Aladdin if I want to. Because it's a 1-1. One -one. I would have to tap the old man, keep the old man tapped. They are finding a Pendlehaven that has summoning sickness. Don't forget that. Hopefully, I'm not um, forgetting that myself. And there he goes and he untaps everything. I mean, this is going to be so difficult. I, can, I, I guess I could steal the Rock Hydra because I can also kind of... Okay, so he's going to attack, and I'm going to steal his flyer. That makes sense. So in my opinion, he waited a little bit too long with just attacking with the flyer. Okay, there's a two-headed giant. And now my old man of the sea is basically keeping me alive, right? 
and keeping that old man tapped because if we untap it, I lose control of the granite gargoyle. There is another mountain and oh, eternal flame. That's it. Eternal flame card from the dark. And uh, yeah, that's it, man. Congratulations winning this game. Well done. Ah, oh, man, I kind of, I felt like, I felt like I could have, I felt like I could have, could have won this one, to be honest. If I wouldn't have used the Simbat to mill my own Ancestral Recall. Why? Why did I do that? Anyway, really cool first game. And how, I mean, MVP of this first game, Two-Headed Giant. What a good card against a Living Plane deck. Okay, so this was game one. Now let's quickly continue to game number two. Game number two, here we go. So wow, after that first loss, I gotta, gotta focus. I gotta remember, two-headed giant can block two creatures. It's got two heads, come on. Makes sense, starting with the forest. Mountain by my opponent, you here. Tapping two forests, will we see Sylvan? Sylvan Library, okay, this is a good start. Not any blue sources, but hey, I've got this interesting bolt to the face. Does that mean that maybe he's got a uh, Wheel of Fortune in hand? That could be an indicator using those bolts and chains so aggressively because he kind of now knows my deck. So he knows maybe I want to kind of keep it, um, you know, to kind of kill lands when Living Plane hits the table. Tapping three here, playing an Energy Flux. So because he's kind of hinting this to me, I'm trying to empty my hand quickly as well. There we see a Stone Rain on my uh, island. That makes sense. I actually have a dual land in hand that I purposefully not, here, here it is, that I not played out earlier because of a possible stone rain. And there we see a protocol sorcerer bolt on the Timmy and no land drops by my opponent here. It really looks like he's got this uh, wheel of fortune in hand. He's playing so aggressively. Tapping three here, playing untamed wild. So that means I can dig through my deck. I can find a basic line, put it into play, untapped, shuffle up again. And that works really well with my Sylvan Library. There's a little synergy there. And of course, Sylvan also works great with my Simbat. So I'm really trying to kind of get as much, um, as much, uh, how do you say, profit as I can from playing with three Sylvan Libraries in this deck. And uh, there we go again. Finding some more cards, another Untamed Wilds. Things are looking good for me also because my opponent simply doesn't find any lands. He's stuck now on two mountains after that strip mine on his third land. And that's kind of bad for me. He needs three lands to cast Wheel of Fortune, to cast more Stone Rains, to cast Granite Gargoyle. I think we just saw him pull that. So he's really stuck right now. And that's never nice when that happens. And if I can even find another uh, Ice Storm, it's going to make matters worse. There we see at least a third mountain playing a Gargoyle. And I've got that Simbat, so I can start using that Simbat to draw extra cards. There we go, finding Tropical Island, playing Tropical Island. And tapping three here, Psionic Blast on the Granite Gargoyle. I've got full control, it seems. Another Gargoyle that's not going to do it. There's a Psy Blast. I actually think that maybe uh, Yoop doesn't have the Wheel of Fortune. Maybe he was just playing aggressively with his direct damage. I mean, I'm already on 10. Maybe that was a strategy. Just burn me out as quickly as possible before I can get any combo on the table. There I go, attacking here after playing the Living Plane. So he's going to drop to, I think, 17. He's not. He hasn't taken any damage prior to this attack. There is another Granite Gargoyle. And, of course, I'm finding a land. And I'm putting it there because it's got Summoning Sickness. I don't want to accidentally tap it or use it in any way. You know, because it's got summoning signals. It's just a 1-1 one, one creature right now. Putting a lot of elves in hand. Only one card in hand, though. And I'm really low. Looks like I'm going to do something else. Playing another Untamed Wilds. Wow. That is crazy. Finding another island. There's a Rock Hydra. And I guess uh, the deck photo that I showed during the deck deck is not entirely accurate anymore because I seem to be playing with a lot more Untamed Wilds. And I'm playing with Simbats and Old Man of the Sea, so it's definitely different. It looks like I'm going to attack with everything here, trying to put on the pressure on my opponent here with my uh, Living Plane strategy. We can see my opponent dropping to 9 here. I'm really trying to play aggressively right now. Tapping 4. There's another Rock Hydra, so he's going to have a 2-2 Rock Hydra. Which is good enough. Oh, just a 1-1. Okay, he's going to tap 3. I thought he had 4 lands there. So it's a 1-1 Rock Hydra. 
Remember, for one red, he can kind of regenerate, prevent one damage, right? So that way he can kind of regenerate ahead. Rock Hydra is such an interesting creature. Really like one of those old school creatures with a lot of text on it. Tapping to find even more lands. Attacking with everything I have right now. So that's 7. That's 10 one ones. And he's going to block the two drops. He's going to block the creatures here. Then he's going to tap, of course, the mountain to save. Let's see what's happening here to kind of save his Rock Hydra. So it is actually a pretty good exchange for Yoop. The problem, though, is he's only on three. So I'm just really trying to swarm him and just go all over him, go wide. And just keep attacking, attacking, attacking. And with my Simbats, I keep finding new lands. So now I'm attacking with everything. He can only block with six. And I believe I've got eight. Oh, I cannot kill him yet. Cannot kill him yet, can I? I think he's stuck on one life. Oh, he's not dead. This is a problem. I probably thought I could kill him. But I can't. Oh, this is bad news. This is, again, a misplay from my side. Um, you know, we saw some mistakes in game one, and I'm just continuing that now. At least I still got the Sylvan. Playing out Lana or else, playing out Soul Ring. I mean, I just made a mistake. I thought I had him. But he's still, you're still on one. He can still win this. Attacking with... No, deciding not to attack with everything, because he's got four blockers. Playing another land passing turn. So basically now I'm trying just to get more creatures on the board than he does. Right now he's got four creatures. Yeah, my soaring dies to my own energy flux. Kind of missed that as well. Playing a little bit sloppy here. But anyway, attacking with everything I have to kill him. He's got four creatures, only four blockers. So that's it. Yeah, I got this game number two. Despite the fact that I wasn't playing really well. So I, I kind of feel like <laughs> I need to make some more flight hours with this deck but at least it's 1-1 one, one. so that means we're going to go into game number three game number three here we go the old deciding game who's going to take this matchup is it going to be me or is it going to be you who's on his mono red big beefy creature deck or am i going to take it with my living plane starting with a forest into lunar elf that's a great start for me are we going to see a bolt no bolt okay fireball instead that's actually pretty good for me because those fireballs freak me out playing living plane myself Let's see what he can do. Not a three drop, no granite gargoyle, no Aladdin. And finding mana number four, casting an Ali from Cairo. It's such an interesting card. Card from Arabian Nights, an 0 one creature that reads damage that would reduce your life total to less than one, reduces it to one instead. So basically, as long as the Ali's around, he can't lose. So let's see if I can find a way to kind of deal with Ali. Uh, first playing an Untamed Wilds again. And there's also a Granite Gargoyle in play there on the side of my brother there. 2-2 two, two Flyer. You can pay one red to give it a plus 0, oh, plus 1, which is pretty annoying. So it's kind of tough to kill. And playing a Time Walk. Okay, that is really good here. Finding a Time Walk. And finding a Trike. Probably going to kill the Ollie, right? What am I going to do? On the other hand, I've got, I've got Timmy's in the deck. I've got Protocol Sorcerers. I don't really have to do anything, really. So deciding to just pass turn. And we see Yoop here playing a Soul Ring. That means he's got five mana. Is he going to play a two-headed giant? He's got four of those in his deck. He's going to play a Knowledge Vault. He's going to start assembling some cards. Remember, in game one, Knowledge Vault was absolutely brutal. Kind of gave him the win, in a way. Attacking here with the Triskelion, putting him back to 16. And playing a Crumble on the Soul Ring. And playing a Crumble on the Knowledge Vault. Interesting choice, though, to do it straight away. I could have chosen to kind of let him, you know, put some mana into it, put some cards under the Knowledge Vault, and then destroy the Knowledge Vault. I guess I didn't want to take any risk, but the better play would have been to do it in the end step of Yoop's uh, turn, instead of in my own main phase still. And now I'm using my Triskelion pretty aggressively, killing the Granite Gargoyle and the Ali from Cairo. So taking care of two creatures with one trike, playing and control magic. Ooh, this is God, ah, this is looking really brutal. And playing a Simbat here. Sylvan Library Simbat combo is online right now. That is a big problem here for, uh, for my opponent. Gonna, of course, find lands here because I put it in that order. So I'm basically drawing two cards a turn right now. 
attacking with the giant, giant blocks giant, so that's a trade-off. Playing a protocol sorcerer, playing another land passing turn here. I'm just going way too fast at this point. There we see a lightning bolt on the protocol sorcerer. And ooh, Wheel of Fortune. That's pretty cool. He had to discard the Sheevan though. But I think it's a good decision. He has to kind of come back. And if he can find some direct damage, he can kind of wipe the board clean. Chain Lightning on the Simbat, which I think is really important. Going to go through my deck. Maybe there is a Regrove there that I can pick. And just drawing one card here. Attacking for two. Going to put him on 18 or what's his life total? 18, I believe. Playing a Prodigal Sorcerer, so playing a Timmy. There's another Bolt on the Timmy again. It's really hard to keep those Timmies alive against a deck with this much direct damage. Ooh, Ali, uh, sorry, Aladdin. Cool thing about Aladdin is it can steal artifacts. It can steal my robots. <laughs> so that's just something interesting. I wonder if he's going to do that. Finding another Tim there. Going to attack for one. Pump it up. Going to deal two more damage. Going to drop. He's going to drop to 16. Okay, playing Old Man of the Sea. Really cool. 2-3 creature. We saw him in action earlier. And uh, I can use him to steal Aladdin. I wonder if he's now going to use his Aladdin to steal my trike. And I can steal his Aladdin. And then he's going to lose his trike. Oh, this is so funny. We're just stealing each other's stuff. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. So we're going to untap here. And I would like to apologize for the deck photo because it, it's not the right deck photo. I actually played with this version of the deck first and the deck photo you saw is already like an updated version and I already have an updated, updated version of that deck. So I'm sure you recognize that when you're making a new deck, you just continue playing and tweaking it. And uh, unfortunately, I had to cut Old Man of the Sea, although it's, it's a really cool card. There we see a Lightning Bolt on the Old Man in response to me trying to take the Aladdin. And then I'm playing Energy Flux. And I wonder if, no, no, Yoop's not willing to pay two mana for 1-1. One, one, so he's gonna, just going to let it die, play a huge Rock Hydra. Rock Hydra time! I like that, man. Just a huge Rock Hydra here. Look at all those counters. It's two, four, six, seven, seven, seven. I'm just so happy it doesn't, uh, it doesn't has tra have trample. Uh, on the other hand, I need to find control magic, hopefully. First pinging Aladdin here down and playing regrowth control magic, probably. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just need to, I need to take over that Rock Hydra. Look at all those counters moving my way. Oh, man. And this is so bad playing mono red. Being somebody that also has mono red decks because I love the creatures in red, uh, I feel your pain, Yoop. I feel your pain. There's just nothing you can do against the control magic. That's why usually, you know, in these decks, you maybe want to play like one or two discs. But, you know, it is what it is. So he's going to be slammed hard here. The control magic being so dominant in this case. The cool thing is here is using his two deserts to deal damage to the Hydra. And remember, for each one damage, the Hydra actually loses a hat. So I'm losing two counters by this attack, which is pretty, pretty sweet, actually, for you. But it's a cool way to kind of stay in this match. He's on nine right now. And uh, I'm just going to attack again. It's still a 5-5, five, five, pretty decent. He's going to block. I'm going to kill it together with my Timmy. But I'm also going to lose some heads. It's now just a 1-1. One, one. So it hasn't been, I mean, I thought with the Rock Hydra I would win the game. It hasn't been that decisive. On the other hand, my opponent's hand is empty. So yeah, this is going to be really hard, especially with my Sylvan there. And I just shuffled again with the Untamed Wilds. And I'm going to try to find some more fuel. I'm just going to attack, pumping up to 2-3. And then he's going to use his Deserts to eventually kill it, because he's going to lose the heads. And playing a Psionic Blast and then playing a Trike. Okay, that's it. That's it. I kind of felt like this was one of those games where I basically like had control from the start. And I, I think what's, what's really interesting, um, at least for me looking back at these games, is I realize, you know, if you've got a new deck, you just have to play it like over and over and over again. And as you can see, we're now looking at the deck photo that I showed you at the beginning. Um, this is obviously a different deck than uh, the deck you saw in action. Well, actually it's the same deck, but um, uh, the deck is um, has been tweaked. So what you can see here is I've decided no longer to play with Old Man of the Sea, which is a beautiful, beautiful card, but it was just not, 
not good enough. Um, and I also cut the Diamond Valley. Diamond Valley kind of felt, why did I put it in there in the first place? Because it's just not that good. I don't have like big beefy creatures that I can sack to it. I don't have, I guess with Control Magic, Diamond Valley could be good. But anyway, I just needed to slot uh, for something else. Obviously Diamond Valley, an amazing card still. Uh, there are people that say, Martin, I'm talking to you, that say it's, you should add it in every deck. Uh, but I made different choices for this one. And actually, this deck photo is not the most recent deck photo. I'm still tweaking it. So, I mean, let me know in the comments below if you want to see my new version of Living Plane on the channel. And, uh, you know, I'll try to, to make some videos where I show that version. But this is not the latest version because in my latest version, as you can see, unfortunately, I cut Simbad as well. And I think in my latest version, I put back one Simbad. Uh, in the main 60 and, and, and I made some other choices, but I guess that's a whole new video. Anyway, thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. Um, and if you liked what you see, man, leave a like, click that thumbs up button. It really helps a lot. There are two other things that you can do to help the channel out and they're completely free. The first thing is leave a comment, man. Spam that comment section with positivity or if you have a question about a game, about a, one of the plays, or you know, if it went too fast and you want to know something about the rules or what kind of rule set we're playing, whatever, ask that in the comment section. Don't be shy. Um, and by leaving a comment, you're actually helping the channel as well and you're showing YouTube that the content that I make is interesting. So for me, it's just great if, if you leave a comment, as long as it's polite, of course. Sometimes you get these ridiculous like hate comments and, and, and or just spam and obviously I take them off the channel. But yeah, just um, if you've got a question, if, if, if you've got a question about the play, uh, play the rule, the, the decks, whatever, man, put them in the comment section. That really helps a lot. Now, the other thing you can do is you can become a subscriber. So if you're new to the channel, welcome here to Timmy Talks. If you want to help me out, simply become a subscriber. Click that subscribe button. It, uh, it really helps a lot. So those are some of the things that you can do. And there's one last thing. You can also become a sponsor of the show. And I'm really thankful um, that I already have more than 100 patrons via the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And if you want to join them, click on there. You can join Timmy Talks tournaments. You can you play a game against me. Um, I'm going to send you a channel pin. There are just a lot of cool things that kind of that you can do once you join the Timmy Talks Patreon program. And I'm really thankful to all the Patreons and the channel members. You guys are really keeping this channel afloat. Thank you very much. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's have a look at the amazing, the fantastic, the wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks.